Awesome. And then just while you're doing that, um, Leanne and Kristen, was there anything that you wanted to add? Nope, no, I'm good with the agenda as is. Okay, and then Jeff, what about for you? Is there anything you want to cover off for you? That's good. Cool. All right, Kate, over to you. Okay. All right, guys. So um, I, I kind of thought it would be helpful just to take a quick recap of all of the many federal grants we've had. I know um, when we were going through the budget process, there's a huge amount of interest um, in our community about, you know, hey, what the heck is all this money and where's it coming from and what's it going to? And um, so there's that and uh, wanting to be really careful to be sure that we keep circling back and, and providing the community with as much information as we can. Um, so that's kind of the FY21 piece. And as we do our report out on year end of FY21 and financials and things like that, we'll, we'll keep coming back to that. But then the other piece is um, making sure that people know what's going on with the uh, money that's available for FY22 and actually on into FY23. Um, so this agenda is posted up online on our new website, which I'm still trying to figure out. It's very cool. Um, it's all the same stuff, but I can't find anything. <laughs> so um, if folks were to go into the Finance Committee agenda online and click on the Grant Fund Overview link, um, you'll see just a little uh, two-page document that runs down the various grants that were provided to Scarborough, um, provided to public schools in Maine back since the CARES Act was, um, was passed. The first COVID related um, federal act was passed in March of 2020. Um, so what we're looking at here is um, started, first grant that came out was ESSER 1. And uh, you know how we love acronyms. Acronyms are just like part and parcel of federal government stuff and schools, so. I couldn't quite tell you what ESSER stands for. I know it was emergency supplemental, you know, squirrel emergency something. Um, I know what coronavirus relief funds, CRF funds are. That was the second thing that came out. So ESSER 1 came out in March of 2020. Um, it was a small-ish amount for Scarborough because those grants were allocated based on Title I parameters and Title I is based on um, on economic need in a community. And so we're a very small Title I community because um, relative to the rest of the state of Maine, we are a fairly wealthy community. So that was a little bit of the money. And um, then right on its heels, not much longer after that came the big coronavirus relief funds. So the bulk of what we spent last year was in CRF. And that's the bulk of what we're reporting out on as well. So ESSER 1, We've been using for supplemental substitute wages and benefits in FY21. And you know, you'll know, you recall through all of our budget conversations that we had a ton of people who were um, staff and students who were remote last year. And then of course we had the hybrid learning model, which meant that we had kids at home um, for a portion of the week all across the district. And so we had a ton of folks um, in the buildings working with folks who were working from home um, in order to accommodate everybody's medical needs during COVID. Um, so supplemental subs were a big use of funding and you'll see that come up in the CRF funds as well. We also used a little bit of the ESSER money, which again was only $100,000 for some of our summer programming um, this summer, just this past summer that, we're, that we ended today, I guess, if you, if you think of September as the end of summer. Um, and the ESSER 1 funds need to be spent by the end of September right now. So they are gone, um, they're done with. Um, the coronavirus relief funds, I've added in a couple of links. They're both in the agenda directly and right here um, with a ton of detail about how that money was spent. And you can see there's two different grants, both of them just over $2 million. This is where um, the bulk of support that we received from the feds uh, has arrived and you know, this is the format in which we were given it. And you'll probably remember 
are saying that uh, the, these funds were authorized. The first set was authorized in July of 2020. And um, because of the federal law timing, we were required to spend that money by December 31st of 2020. So we had this very short window of time to figure out how to spend the money and write a, a grant application and get it in and get it approved and start spending money. And everything that we spent the money on needed to be in our hands by December 30. So it was kind of a crazy rush, a mad rush to figure out what could you get that would be helpful, um, support us in this COVID environment, support us in the hybrid learning environment, uh, but also be quick. Um, then the second grant came out in September and it had the same crazy deadline. So you had to spend all of the money by December 30 of 2020. And it's already the end of September when you get the grant funds allocated to you. So um, a lot of business managers uh, took up um, heavy drinking and <laughs> were just stressed to the max. And, and, we, and we all survived, I think. And uh, we all figured out really cool and innovative ways to spend this money. Um, so good for us. And then about the time we had it all figured out, um, the uh, feds extended, or the state and the feds together extended the deadline for spending to June 30, 2021. So thank you very much, guys. That was great. Um, the one thing that that allowed us to do is to pivot a little bit on the second CRF grant and to um, change up a little bit of what we were doing there. We had uh, about $200,000 left that we hadn't spent yet before December 30. It was about December 15 when they changed the rule. And we had a plan for it, we had orders in and we canceled them and said, no, we're gonna do something different. And we diverted about, about $200,000 to staffing so that we could keep on more supplemental subs. But that was about the only thing that we really did to make a change to the applications because they were all uh, valid, they were serving great purposes and they, um, you know, they were mostly expended by the time we had a chance to extend the deadline. So this will tell you the, the four different coronavirus relief grants. Um, one that you heard quite a bit about was a partnership that we had with Scarborough Community Services uh, where they wrote a grant for just under $60,000 to help them kick off the hub program um, which was a new program for them to support hybrid learning. And um, that was a collaboration between community services and our office because um, under the law, we had to manage the grant and um, they ran the program. So we had a, a cool time collaborating on that. And the adult ed grant was very small, but it was, it was really helpful because we had a lot of the same challenges in adult ed that we had in um, K-12 learning in terms of you know, not being able to have folks in person, needing some more technology, um, you know, having the opportunity to get people on Wi-Fi, get people on laptops and continue some of this critical learning that folks in our community were in the midst of, um, but also you know, not able to do in the way that they had started out. Um, so I'm not going to go through and read these individual documents, but I do want to pull one up real quick just to show folks the scope of what we're doing. And this is really weensy, and I'm sure you can't really see it very well on the screen, but um, if you take a look at it, this is a follow-up to documents that you guys have seen, I think a couple of times now, where it lays out how we budgeted um, the grant funds, and um, I've, the only thing that I've done is I've added a column over on the right-hand side that says this is what we actually ended up spending. Um, and within these grants, the um, parameters of the grants allow you to be a little over budget in the individual line items. Um, if, you're, if you're off by 10% of the total value of the grant, in, in any of these lines, as long as the lines exist and they've been approved, if one's up a little bit and the other's down a little bit, that's allowable. Um, so this shows you that we were pretty close to on target, but in some cases we paid a little bit more than what we expected. And in some cases we saved a little bit of money. Um, but I think this is really powerful stuff for the community to take a look at um, in terms of, you know, where did that money go? What did you do with it? And there's an awful lot of detail in here um, you know, right down to the day-to-day -day stuff that we were doing 
um, in our different departments and um, how we were, were putting this money to good use to keep schools running in the midst of the pandemic. So there's two of these grids, one for CRF1, one for CRF2, they look pretty similar. Um, and I would encourage folks to take a peek into those. Um, and I'm also, sorry, go ahead. So just one question on the, I think, I think this is obvious, but I just want to confirm the grants were in addition to the original CRF fund, right? The 59,000 wasn't deducted from our 2 million, 2,000. That is good. correct. Yeah, these are in addition to, and so what, what happened was um, the feds allocated an enormous amount of money to the state of Maine and said, you know, here's some cool things you could do with this state of Maine. Off you go, you, you all figure out what you need. And so it was at the state level that they developed all these little individual funds. Um, so there, you know, there are grants going out to special purpose, purpose private schools. There were grants going out to higher ed. There were grants going out in a lot of different directions. Um, so the CRF one and two, like you said, Sarah, those were K-12, um, general education, whatever you guys need to run your schools. And then there were separate little grants um, for day programming and adult education. Um, and I did put a note on this one that we've invoiced all of these, that these had to be done by June 30, which they were, they were, most of it was done um, by December 30 for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, but these are all, these are all spent, done, build out and paperwork in giant binders on my desk. ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 are the two grants that we're gonna be using in the current fiscal year in FY22. Um, ESSER 2 was delivered in January of 2020. It was allocated to, to schools and, and we kind of set it aside at that time. And you'll remember talking about this in our budget conversations um, to wait and see while we were spending 4 million of CRF funds, what it would be that would be left over um, that would still need to be addressed uh, after that money was used up, after the CRF money was gone. So in our FY22 budget conversations, we determined that we would use ESSER II um, uh, to the tune of $438,000 to fund five teacher positions. Um, you may recall that we had originally put five additional positions in our operating budget. Um, and then we eventually said, okay, actually it looks like we're gonna have, now we're gonna have ESSER three, so that's gonna be lots of money and we'll be able to use ESSER two to address those five positions. Um, these funds are available in fiscal year 22 and, and to the end of September. So it's a perfect fit. We'll, we'll spend all of that money out on those five positions um, in the course of this upcoming school year. And um, then comes ESSER 3, uh, which was released in July of 21, uh, sorry, in March of 21. And ESSER 3, it, it kind of felt like the, the state took a big deep breath and, and remembered that they actually know how to manage federal grants and that they have a system and that they should really probably be following that along. And I say that with the utmost respect because money was thrown at us in a crazy way and in a crazy time frame. Um, but ESSER, three has more of the same kind of um, requirements that our normal federal grants have, Title I, Title II, local entitlement, the grants that we see every year from the feds. And I say that because um, they're looking for more documentation in terms of how the money is allocated. They're looking for more reporting in terms of, um, you know, what the impacts are on students, on student learning. Um, where the CRF grants were really just, oh my gosh, you need a bus. Holy cow, you need air conditioning. You need, you know, you need tents. It was the ARP ESSER grant is um, much more focused on student learning, student outcomes, student social emotional development. And so on our end, we have decided that the best way to use it is to improve the experience of our students in this current year. Um, so far, we've allocated about half of the money, 20% of the money 
uh, has to be targeted. You'll see here uh, to address learning loss, provide social emotional intervention. It's very prescriptive and it's um, mostly um, intended to be used for programs outside over and above what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we used quite a bit of money to fund programs in the summer, um, this past summer that we've just ended. And I, I, I know that Monique has been working on um, a gen ed program report that she wants to share with you guys in, in an upcoming meeting. I don't know exactly when that will turn up, um, but I've been collaborating with her on that data collection piece. Uh, because we were able to put on quite a few really cool programs um, all the way from K to 12 um, to serve students during the summertime and do a little bit of credit recovery and a little bit of enrichment and just some really nice, nice stuff there. And we still have money left over from that 20% to do the same thing throughout this school year um, and into the summer next year. Um, now, the bulk of the funds in ESSER 3, um, what we've what we've done in terms of um, the why behind how we've chosen to spend the money is to collect as much feedback as we could from our school community. And when I say school community, we did surveys all through last year um, and uh, particularly in the spring and around budget time and talking about reopening, surveys with staff, surveys with students, surveys with families, and it, it felt once the leadership team sat down to process through all of that, um, those responses, it felt like the biggest ask was for um, smaller class sizes, more hands-on um, access from teachers to students, and a, and a concern that if we just went back from hybrid learning to business as usual with our normal you know, reasonable class sizes in a reasonable time, um, that we would be doing all of our kids a little bit of a disservice, not to just have that extra staff available to make this transition a little more comfortable. Um, so you'll see the second bullet there, plan for use of fundings in FY22, um, three one-year teacher positions to allow smaller class sizes. Um, and then more specifically to our current situation, uh, one year position at the high school to really focus on credit recovery, SEL, um, and, and making sure that our high school kids who are you know, at that end point of their, their school career where, where um, you know, the loss of a class or a failure has somewhat higher consequences, as a lot of you know, um, with your older kids, uh, it, it would be a, an opportunity for an extra level of intervention at the high school. And then uh, we also have one transition specialist position um, at Wentworth School. We really didn't have enough um, academic support or, or like a bridge teacher like we do at middle school to ensure that we had somebody who could really um, tag team with regular classroom teachers and make sure that kids coming and going um, with quarantines and absences and some of the disruptions that have happened and are likely to continue to happen as we transition to uh, full-time in-person learning, um, that those kiddos have support um, when they're in or out of school and, and when they're transitioning back and forth. And the last position that's on here is a pool testing coordinator position. Um, Y'all heard a bit about pool testing, um, both you know, individually in a meeting and, and also as part of our reopening plan, and we're still pursuing that. We actually have an ad out there um, looking for someone to take that position. And that would be um, like a coordinator, um, what's the right word? Like a, a, a management position at the district level, not an administrative position, but... Um, someone to make sure that the, the program is working smoothly and, and that scheduling is happening and shipping is happening and um, coordinating with the, with the buildings. So that's a lot to say about what's going on in FY22. The cool thing is that the funds are available in this particular grant all the way through to September of 23. Um, so these are the areas that we've identified immediate need and um, there are Certainly, 
um, unknowns, unexpected expenses or unexpected needs, I should say, that will arise um, as we come back to school and get things going again. And so um, that was about as far as we went and we were happy to say, okay, we'll, we're, we'll hold the rest of those funds in reserve um, until we see how school reopening goes and we see you know, what it is that we haven't thought of yet because Lord knows we've uh, been super flexible, but we've learned an awful lot in the last 18 months and we're likely to learn a thing or two more before we're done. Um, and then the last thing on this page is just some uh, description of the slightly more stringent requirements around these, this particular grant in terms of what the, the um, state and the federal government are looking for, um, for reporting out. And I, I put this last little um, paragraph here because one of the big driving factors in ESSER 3, or they call it ARP ESSER, um, is a concern about underserved communities, um, demographics that have been um, more adversely affected by the pandemic perhaps than others. And um, so they're, they're paying really close attention to um, some of the segments of our community that might be in uh, deeper struggles than other sections. And so I, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that um, it, in, by increasing supports for all students, by decreasing class sizes, um, and by providing specific types of interventions in each of our buildings, what we're hopeful for is that um, we will address the needs of any student who is struggling. And so therefore, if a group of students is struggling to a higher degree than others, then those kids will be quickly identified and quickly provided with additional support. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it feels like the, at least we feel as though the interventions that we're putting into place are gonna serve that need. That's a lot of talking. <laughs> and I didn't even stop for questions, so go for it. I have a couple of thoughts, but Kristen and Leanne, I'll, I'll start with you guys. What comments or questions do you have? I don't think I have anything. I think this is, you know, not, not new information. Maybe the last little bit of it, but I appreciate it, Kate. It's very thorough. I echo that incredibly thorough, Kate. Thank you. You're welcome. And I, you know, I, I said right at the beginning, we're, we're, it's an area of interest and you know whenever a few million dollars falls from from heaven onto a community um, there's an understandable interest in where that went and so we want to make sure that uh, folks in our community know what's going on and uh, hopefully that they can trust that we're we're doing good work with this stuff and and you know thank goodness for it because we certainly wouldn't have survived without it and we certainly wouldn't have thrived without it in the way this that we did last year okay i only have two questions and then a comment really just for leanne and kristen um on how we can circulate this information um is there do you have a like a rough estimate of what um, for the our ESSER or ESSER 3 of the things that we've decided to spend the money on so far, what that amounts to of the total? Um, you know, I have a number someplace because they're all teacher positions. I think we're using like a, a generic average like we do in our budget of 82,000. Okay. Um, and then the only other one was the pooled testing coordinator, which is a little different category. We wouldn't, wouldn't consider it the same. But I can I can put a price tag on that for sure, and I can also put a price tag out there on what we've actually spent for the summer programs. Okay, um, and it that's something that's that'll come up in the first quarter report. Um, maybe we could do it as an addendum to that. Yeah. So he, what kind of what I was thinking, and if if we can't do it for tomorrow night's meeting, um, maybe for another one in the, the second one in September or October was basically just trying to take all this information and put together like a couple simple pie charts that show like what we got, 
what we've spent and of what we've spent, what have we spent it on in those categories? Um, and then what remains? Um, so like pretty simple things that I think we could probably pull together relatively quickly in an Excel spreadsheet, as long as we just have all the data. Um, but I think Leanne and Kristen, that was gonna go to my comment and sort of, this is actually pretty simplified and, and but also thorough in the same way. So I, I think this as uh, on its own is a good communication tool. Um, but if there's sort of one step up that we can do that would be useful now, um, that also helps us as we go into the next budget cycle. Um, I'm thinking like some sort of pie chart or something might be useful that we can continue to update as we, we continue to spend money. Sarah, tell me your vision in terms of a pie chart. Are you thinking a pie chart with for each grant and saying like here's CRF one and we spend it on facilities and buses and like that? Or I would say in total. Or in yeah. total. Here's all the federal money we've got. Here's CRF and here's yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think at the end of the day, I mean, Leanne and Kristen, please, you know, chime in with your your perspective. I don't think it really matters what grant necessarily came from, but I, I do think it matters what we've spent it on. Mm -hmm. Um and how much of what we've received we spent and how much we're kind of holding on to to see uh, holding on to is maybe not the best phrase, but we're, we're, we're utilizing, you know, for future needs. Okay. Are you imagining, Sarah, that it would be one total for CRF and one for ESSER? My only concern with combining those two is that they had different requirements on them. Yeah. <laughs> I am like, I literally just came up with this. So I, I'm, we're open, like, let's maybe play around with it and see, maybe we can do one for each and we can do one combined and see how it looks and figure out, um, you know, what, what resonates best with people. Uh, ultimately, I think the goal, and this kind of bleeds into our next conversation as we come into the next budget cycle, I think the, the biggest question is gonna be how much of what you spent from the grants uh, you know, that didn't come out of the taxpayers' pockets, are you now going to ask for the taxpayers? And what did, what, what did you spend that on? And so the earlier we can get ahead of that and have tools to sort of communicate that, um, I think the better off we're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, maybe it's both really, because I mean, it's one of these things, Sarah, where you've got like, you've got the opportunity to have so many different levels of detail, depending on what people are interested in. You just keep drilling down and your super geeks can drill all the way down on the line items if they want to. But um, I know in, in the budget book, just comes to my mind, the, the pie charts that we have in there is like, okay, here's what your our total budget is. And then we do a separate one for salaries and benefits and how that breaks out. And maybe we could do something like that. Like a, you know, here's all the grants. And then, you know, here's particularly the CRF, I think, because it is there, there are so many different categories of spending where the other ones are more personnel. Right. Um, yeah, we could play around with that. Absolutely. And then I know that um, at some point, communications put out a really nice version of the CRF charts um, back before, you know, when we were sort of halfway spent through that process, but they were, they were at least you know, the same kind of description about here's what, how much money we have and here's where we plan to spend it. Um, so mm -hmm. we could, you know, go back to that same idea and just say, and here's how we did spend it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true too. I remember a pretty, pretty detailed communication somewhere in the midst of the budget cycle of, you know, here's what's going on with the grants. Yeah, that one that you guys put together is great. But you're absolutely right. I mean, as soon as we get talking about what our ask is for budget FY23, that question is going to arise again. Well, how much of this stuff was federal and is now going to be local? And, you know, luckily, I think the answer is pretty, pretty small. Um, the only thing we've talked about really hanging on to in the long term is, is those positions at middle school that were where our, our enrollment numbers were out of whack with the rest of the district in terms of class size before COVID. Um, but, you know, by the time we get to those conversations, hopefully we'll have a pretty solid sense of where enrollment's going this year, because yeah. this year could be fluky too. But yeah, just to be able to say, yeah, we bought this and no, you don't have to buy it again tomorrow could be a important. Yeah. 
All right, well, why don't I take the action to just think about what that might look like? And then Kate, we can go back and forth and share with Leanne and Kristen and get everyone's feedback. And, and I'm not going to try and rush and do something for the committee update tomorrow, but maybe we can have the goal of, of having that in the committee update for the October meeting. Well, and I do have on, on my um, radar that at some point I'm going to need to have that meeting with you guys that where you do the year end, I do a, a year end recap and, and you do mm -hmm. budget transfers and the school lunch transfer. Um, which I said to Jeff this morning, I, I think it would be really cool if we didn't have that policy because it's kind of dumb. Um, but, <laughs> but as long as we do, and, you know, I guess, I, I don't know if I, I should say it's a dumb policy. I, I think the threshold of $10,000 on a $55 million budget might be getting a little bit out of skew, but. Is, is um, that a, a Scarborough policy or a Maine policy or? It's a Scarborough policy. It's not required as far as I know. We should check with Drummond on that one, I guess. I don't think, I think we made it up. Oh, fun. I know. Cool. I, I shouldn't really say, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that for sure, but is that, it's DBJ, I think. Okay. I'll, I'll ask somebody who knows these things. I just do it, you know, I'm such a good little soldier. You are. Um, all right, cool. That's, I mean, that also leads in nicely to our next topic, but uh, was there anything else on the grant funding? Um, no, again, you know, wanting to make sure that, that we're out there with communication, making sure that, you know, as many public meetings where we can talk about this stuff, the more the better. And so I thank you for listening through some things you've heard before. Um, but, you know, we'll continue to work together to make sure that the community gets their scoop. And I'll, I'll um, hop in here and maybe take some notes on the goals piece, because we just put in a couple of things that we had already talked about, but there's, there's going to be more. Um, can I just check Leanne and Christine, can you guys, if Kate's sharing her screen, can you also see the video or would be more helpful if she stopped sharing what we talked? I don't need to be in it right now. I, I can see both. I, the way that I, the screen is set up, I can see um, everybody but Diane. So maybe if we weren't sharing, then it would be bigger okay. panels. It's up to you, Sarah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty flexible. I'll get out. It's all Great. good. Thanks. I, I just know that like with April, when, if someone's sharing, she can't see anybody. So figured I would ask. Um, cool. So goals. Um, Kate put some stuff, like some bullets in there already in, in terms of goals and want to talk through and, and Chris and Leanne get your thoughts on, you know, other than a bullet point, like what are the things that we want to accomplish? What is the finance committee's role in some of these big projects? I think that's a big question for me. Um, uh, I think to, to pick up where we just left off the last discussion, um, just to get us started here, one of the things that I think three years ago when we started, Leanne, at the, as the finance committee, um, or I guess since I started on the finance committee, we talked about wanting to update the policy. Um, and then we never kind of got around to it because, you know, things happen. And I do, but I do think that it's, well, it's, it's certainly outdated. We don't really follow it um, because it is outdated. And so I do think we need to, you know, maybe have a session with the policy committee, or I don't really know how we work, how that works, but I, I would like that to be a goal going into the next year is to really kind of clean up the policy. Um, and then Kate, maybe, you know, having a little look at what that threshold is um, as part of that, that process. So the, Sarah, are you speaking of the, the DBJ or the total budget development policy? Both. Okay. Yeah. I think any finance or budget related policy, um, it's worth us have taking some time to go through and making sure that it's up to date. Um, Leanne, Kristen, what do you think? Absolutely. Um, specifically looking at how we do the budget process we're not following it. And if we're not, we need to make sure that the policy adhere, we either adhere to the policy or we adjust the policy to how we manage this. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think, you know, we've kind of the last two use cycles at least, not that we've gone off the rails, but we've kind of just adapted and reacted to the circumstances and, um, it would be interesting to kind of go back through and then Jeff get your perspective on, 
you know, where we can do things differently, better um, or otherwise based on your previous experience as well. And that is, you know, from start to finish, from, you know, engaging with the community, from getting feedback from um, the staff and just the whole process from end to end. Okay. So it sounds like we're in agreement that pol that policy review is one goal. Um, what else? I don't know if it's so much of a goal is, but to continue. Um, I think the collaboration with council, with the unified messaging and having things on that share portal really has been helpful and beneficial. It gives everybody a place to go that is clean, clear, uniform to get information. Yeah. And a lot of the supplemental docs that Kate puts together where it kind of boils everything down into the, where are we, what's changed? That has made such a big difference because it, it, again, as things are in motion, there's no ambiguity. It, it is just, yeah. you know what's happening. I'm smiling because I think there was a comment this year about that brand new document that Kate used that we've been using for years now. <laughs> yeah. yeah when, when did we invent that? That was like <laughs> five years ago. It's good to yeah, feel yeah, fresh yeah. though, right? Yeah. You know? I'll, I'll, I'll take credit five years later. It's all good. <laughs> uh, that's that's hey, a good Monique's the one. Monique's the one who says, you know, they when they're ready to learn, that's when they learn. It doesn't matter how many times you say it. Love it. Uh, what do we what do we actually call that document though? I just wrote it as change summary documents change. to follow through the process. Um, I, I'm sure they have some sort of a label, but I think I call them process docs. I think it's, yeah, the budget development process doc. Is that it? Yeah, I like that title. Oh yeah, okay. Um, okay, uh, Kristen, any thoughts from you on that or on goals for next year? Um, I'm just trying to, when do we do our board goals? Because are they going to factor into what the goals for the finance committee will be next year? I don't even remember when we did those last year. I don't think you'll do them until probably the new board. So like November, right? Okay. So the new members are sworn in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just know like last year, the consolidated school was a board goal. It was a finance committee goal to get that yeah. done yeah so i mean look maybe we should just chat about that for a second like it seems as though that's probably going to be the goal again for the board this year or a one of the goals so what is and this is a genuine question like what is the role of the finance committee in pushing that through do you know i don't know and i think that last year it sort of came to us because we needed that funding to get the planning process started. So I don't know, cause I don't know what to anticipate for the next level of funding for the project. Yeah. Kate, in your experience with Wentworth, was, what role did the finance committee play? Do you remember? I'm trying to think because Wentworth was one of those sort of truncated processes where we had, we did a bunch of development work and then we stopped because we had a failed referendum and then we put it all on a shelf and then we came back to it again. So um, it, it feels to me like, um, at least in the business office, the role that we played didn't really kick off until we actually had a project going. And then we were doing, you know, actual budgeting and project management, um, you know, reporting out on expenditures, just like we would on anything else. Um, so um, I suppose being finance committee, it would be similar to what we were trying to do when we were trying to put a price tag on the turf field project of just, you know, let's, if, if we need to get money out there in the budget, and Christian just said this, you know, we need a certain amount of money to move forward in stages. What's that look like? Um, and then, 
you know, by the time you're going to put a dollar sign on a referendum for a building project, you, you've already engaged with an engineer, an architect, and, and you've got a lot more specifics about what it is that you're asking for. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sort of talking around your question, Sarah. I think, I think that the finance committee is, I think it probably in more of a support role, like a strategic support role than, than a drive the conversation role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of weird to, to state it as a goal and we don't really know, right, or have much control. Right now it's owned technically by the BSC. Um, well, and, and, you know, instead of saying that our goal is facilities planning, which it kind of isn't, I mean, it's, it's not our scope of work precisely, but we could say something about, you know, support on the financials, you know, required financial information, something like that. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what words to use, but it's more, again, it's like a, you know, Oh, and by the way, here's the price tag. Like with, with the turf field, you know, April came talking to the town council and, you know, it's their project. They kind of know what it is. You would think that it would be sort of a foregone conclusion, but their big question was, well, can somebody make some slides that shows why those numbers, you know, what's the history of it and why is this the price tag for it? So we did that. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I would do. I think if we're, if we're talking even generically around the building project. Yeah. I guess um, I'm like, yes, true to all those things. I just wonder like if there's anything necessarily for the finance committee to do or if really that's just kind of falls to you and, and Jeff, Kate at this point, rather than having it as like a stated objective for the finance committee. No, I would agree. I think it's, you know, it's secondary. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. So if I were to take the bullet smash it and smash it, slash it, should I, should I, could it, cut it, it's going away. I feel okay. slightly different. I feel slightly differently about the turf project though. I don't know. Chris, is that what you were going to say? I was just too far. Say, we're not lumping the turf into that same category, are we? Because no. it's sort of a different beast. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that then, Kristen? I don't know. I think this is probably more a question for Kate and Jeff. So I'm not like, well, first, when we're talking about the turf, are we talking about the actual project happening or are we talking about the long term possibility of the school department owning that facility? Both. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I guess I'm hoping that the, you know, it passes a referendum, obviously, and then we don't really have a role in it anymore, correct? I mean, it's in the budget already yep. that was in this year's budget. So I would think our role in terms of the turf is more about the next step of it, whether it's a financially doable thing for the school department to run that facility. And that ties into your budget conversations, right? Because that's gonna be a big shift in the town school allocation of, of budgeted funds. Yep. If during the course of the next year, we, we decide that school needs to be managing things the town currently is or vice versa yeah. so maybe we could just label it that you know transition or realignment between school and town budget <clears throat> yeah can we call it potential so that it's not like a foregone, foregone conclusion yeah um I mean, I don't think it is. I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of other, there's a lot of planning and, and conversations that need to have, have, that have to happen between, you know, community programs, town leadership, and school leadership around the maintenance and, and partnership that exists for the, for the grounds and the facilities. Yeah, agreed. So is it out of phase yet, Jeff, in your opinion, where the finance committee is involved in that? No, I think that I think that's a totally separate issue, even from even from the the, the turf and um, track replacement. You know, which is which is a, a much needed um, facilities expenditure, um, and then how that 
how the facilities then get maintained and, and personnel and all that kind of stuff. And if that partnership is is to, to change, that's that's kind of, I would treat those as two separate things. Yeah. And as far as like the finance committee of, of the board, that, that, would, that would certainly be more involved, you know, if we're, if we're budgeting personnel differently or maintenance costs differently for that facility, then, that, then we would have a lot more, you would need to have much more of a role in that. Um, but that's different than just, you know, getting, getting, getting this thing fixed or right? getting it replaced. Those are kind of two different pieces. Yeah, I think we're, my, I, I agree with that. And I think where, where our role will come in, right, is let's say it passes, great. Um, the conversations that we had that we never really had through to resolution was, okay, so when it does pass, then what? And who takes over that? And what does that cost? And making sure that, like, it's clear that, you know, that's going to increase our budget ask. And we're doing it because we were asked to take over, and it's going to increase it because we were asked to take over responsibility for this. So when we present to town council, like that, we it's our responsibility just to make that clear and be really transparent about what those costs are and why we have them and what that increase looks like. Um, but I think that's the gist of what our role is. I, I would, I would think. Right, and I, and then it sort of falls to that sort of um, you know fiscal responsibility piece too, like when it um, on both of those things where you've got a project running, you want to make sure that finance committee is getting a report that says it's on time and under budget and that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of what changes might be made between town and school management of facilities, then that's definitely a budgetary impact. So I almost feel like some of these things fit underneath like the budget management category, because that's the piece that the finance committee would have the most responsibility for versus the whole project. Yeah. Okay. Um, with all of these, Kate, wh what I can do is just take a look at your notes and then tomorrow or later tonight, try and draft like a couple of clear like goals. And then I'll share those with Leanne, you and Kristen or, or this whole group. And then once we agree on the verbiage, I can share that at our meeting tomorrow night. Um, but keep them pretty high level. I mean, I don't think we need to have like metrics or anything like that but just like what are the things that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of months so i i'm not doing a very good job of notes but i'm like i'm going to put instead of like facilities management i'm going to put budget and fiscal management budget and fiscal oversight let's call it oversight and then under that can be turf field and track and potential realignment of town school management of grounds and facilities so it's like it's carving out the particular area of those projects or those ideas that would fall to finance committee more than others mm -hmm. okay. i also added a bullet that says align with board goals as developed because i think you know kristen's point is is well taken that if the board is saying as a whole we want to work on x and there's an element for that that falls to the finance committee you'd have to be prepared to align with that yeah okay um and then the only other thing that was on there and i don't know if this becomes a goal or it's just sort of a, a check mark exercise kate that we do is the establishment of that capital reserve fund mm -hmm. yeah it's more of a to-do almost than it is a goal yeah. Because we've already said through the budget process that we have a chunk of money, some $400,000 that's going to go towards um, creating that some kind of a capital reserve fund. And, and in my vision, that was, I, I was thinking it would be cool to have a board workshop at some point and um, have somebody like Bill Stockmeyer from John Woodson come in, who's like the guru of all capital reserve fund development things or somebody like that to say to the public here's what it is here's why you're doing it um, here's what it's for um, and then some of it is just bureaucratic um, actually Ruth mentioned Ruth Porter mentioned that she had done some kind of a workshop with 
uh, the council because they had a similar um, goal in their budget to set aside some reserve funds. So we might be able to pull some resources from that as well. And then it's just a matter of building a fund in Munis, which is my job. I would work with Ruth um, and she would set it up on the uh, banking side so that it's something that's segregated and you know something that's earning interest and something that we know is a long-term fund, um, kind of like the, the bond funds that we do for capital projects. Um, but I think the big piece that the, the finance committee could lead the conversation on would be, okay, so what are our parameters? And there are, there are rules and regs about what you can use reserve funds for, but there's also some flexibility in terms of what we see as the ideal use for those funds and you know, what's, what's our, um, our reason, our best reasoning for setting them aside. And, and so that when you leave that to, the, to a future board to vote to spend the money, there are some kind of guidelines there in place as to the intent, why, why the money was put away in the first place. Is there a, a timeline for when we need to take action on this? Well, the good news is that we won't actually have the money in hand until we get to about the last payment of general purpose aid in fiscal 22. Um, and what will end up happening is until uh, we, we set up the fund and we, we make an allocation to it, uh, it'll just be general fund surplus because right now the subsidy is coming in and, and we've budgeted a certain amount of subsidy. And then by the end of the year, there'll be an extra $400,000 of subsidy that we've said we're gonna put aside. Um, so there's not a rush to it. Um, it'll be something that we'll wanna do around or prior to the end of the fiscal year, but we basically have all year before we even have the money to put, put away. Okay. But we don't have to wait on that to do a workshop and understand. We don't, no. And, and so I, I was kind of seeing it as, you know, we get the school year going and we get all of the big crazy things off the off the plate. And then before we dive into the, the heavy budget meetings, maybe there's a, a nice sweet spot in there where we could do a workshop. Um, I haven't talked to Jeff about the, the school board calendar at all. So I'm sure there's probably a spot where that would fit in. It's like November, I don't know, mid-November. <laughs> mid-November is a good time for that. Stop. Oh no, I'm seeing early October, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> is it time to is it time to use the expression short timer yet? I don't know. <laughs> when do we when do we get to trot that out? I'll be riding off into the sunset somewhere by then. Hey, that's, um, a lot, that's a lot nicer than lame duck. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the lame duck power is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, so my, what I might do as far as that's concerned is, is chat with Jeff about, you know, if there's a natural place for that to fit into the um, school board's calendar, because it is an ad, it's not something we typically do on our normal rotation of cool things boards do. Um, in, in all seriousness too, like personally there, I would like to, you know, we've done pretty well with the budget, but like, I, I would like to be able to, for us to notch off either like the creation of that or at least beginning those conversations or the policy stuff before, you know, November. So, I mean, that's, that's a little selfish, but I think that we can, we can choose one of those things and, and maybe we just have a conversation with the policy committee to say like what they're, because I think they have, oh, you guys are on the policy committee, right? Or Leanne, you are. I am. What's the queue look like? Um, I think we have a couple of things that are ahead of it, but not much. Um, so I can bring this to Alicia and ask that we take a look at them. Yeah, maybe just see like if it's something that we could fit in between. It's, it's certainly not like a huge priority, right? But if we can squeeze it in in the next month or two, then let's see. <laughs> use that as our goal and then if not then maybe we prioritize the capital reserve okay I, th I think it makes sense to, if we can to do the policy to have your experience as part of that process because yeah you have been the chair for the last three years so otherwise we're just going to call you when we get around to it <laughs> <laughs> just yeah make sure you bill me for my time we're going to send you a <laughs> <call me wrong. laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Cool. Yeah, and I, and I think that the, that is actually something that requires us to wrangle with our current process and our understanding of how things work more so than the capital reserve fund, which is kind of a prescriptive process. You know, here's how you do it. Here's what you have to do. Here's what you have to vote on. Um, I think I think Kristen's right. Having your expertise at the table and your experience over the past few years, Sarah, might be more helpful in the policy discussion if that's something that fits in with the policies uh, committees. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Leanne, if you don't mind taking that action and then letting me sure. know, and we can kind of build our next meeting schedule around what we decide to do next. Awesome. Um, Kate, was there anything that you need us to take action on that's going to require a meeting in the next couple of weeks? Well, I guess I'm wondering what we should do in terms of setting up that um, board meeting requirement for me to report out and to do those budget transfers. As long as it happens before November, whatever Veterans Day is, that's when we have our audit visit. Yeah. Um, I'm good. So I think last year we might have pushed it out to the second meeting in October. We've done it anywhere from the second meeting in September to a month later than that. Um, maybe the are, are you good? You're still doing the business meeting and then the workshop meetings. Is that still the, the, the layout or is everything a business meeting or how's that work? I haven't heard otherwise. I think it's, it's still the, it's still the same, right? Leanne, you know, so. yeah. pretty sure it is. Well, I'll just let April know that we need to get this on the calendar before then. And then she can work with Jeff on whatever, what else you guys have in terms of priorities and make sure that we get okay. it in what's what's the right day for it okay yeah because cool. i think it's usually like um what 10 minutes yeah it would have, it would have to be in october if you're trying to get done by veterans day that veterans day is the 11th yeah and that's that's it actually falls on a thursday so there is not a meeting that evening Right, so the, the, um, the need that I have is to have budget authority or to have um, authority to make changes in the financial system based on, on you guys voting on those budget transfers and then just enough time to make them happen in the financial system, which is pretty quick. Um, frankly, it's you know, a day's work, not a month's work. So okay. um, you know, whenever it fits into a meeting prior to beginning in November. I guess if we could do it one of the October meetings, that would be cool. Okay. Well, it's on Jeff's radar and I will put it on April's radar and we'll, we'll get it on there. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm going to put action items. Liam, we'll see when policy committee has time to collaborate. Oh, wait, is there a meeting on Thursday the 4th? Um, first, oh, yeah. first and third, right? There should be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Thursday the fourth, it could be November fourth. I don't know why I don't have the. That'll be a, a a different board, Kate. So then someone else will get stuck with reading all those numbers. So that's great. Oh, yeah. right. I think a guest speaker oh, no. is, is a good idea. <laughs> Sarah just <laughs> learned how to read all the numbers. She's so good at it. Just learn, because I I now spell them out. Like yeah. I, I write out on my own screen. 75,000. The whole like two screen thing has been really beneficial. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we could get it done before there's three new board members, that would be agreed. Kristen <laughs> cool. just doesn't want to read the numbers. Kristen, you got to practice up just in case. I've got, I've got a screen for each of my personalities. It's perfect. <laughs> Oh, can somebody teach me how to do filters? I want to do that thing where I'm a cat or something. I think that's no. and, then I'll, and then Sarah will start sneezing. Oh, no, that that Dallas lawyer who did that who did that whole somebody thing. Somebody did that in a meeting. I'm like, I want to do that. That's so, that's so cool. I'm a nerd. I can do that. And the judge was like, uh, sir, do you realize that you're a cat right now? <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> so bad. Uh, all right, cool. I think that's it. 
Nobody, nobody's on to give us any public comment, unfortunately. Nobody's listening. Oh, no viewers today. So, all right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.